Scientists, doctors, and researchers from around the world are working to find effective treatment for the coronavirus. The science of treating COVID-19 tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Dr. Kelly Evans, one of the Prairie Docs. We have been wrestling with this virus for months now. What have we learned and what is being tested? We answer your questions about the science behind treatment of COVID-19 or any other questions about the coronavirus you may have as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376 6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Tonight we are joined by Dr. Michael Pietala of the Yankton Medical Clinic. Michael, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. We love the jackrabbit in the background there broadcasting from Brookings, South Dakota here. Um, yeah. So Michael, tell us about what you do in Yankton and what you're experiencing there when it comes to the coronavirus. Uh, so I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician. Um, I'm the I director of ICU services at Sacred Heart Hospital, one of the Avera hospitals in the state. Um, I work at the Yankton Medical Clinic as well. And, you know, we're taking care of patients with the virus, both on an outpatient and an inpatient basis. Uh, we don't have anything like the major outbreak they're seeing in Minnehaha County or Grand Island, Nebraska or New York City, um, but we're prepared to see more cases come in. And we're managing some pretty sick people. And, and then again, we're managing some people who have you know, minimal symptoms. Mm -hmm. Good, and you, as we were talking before the show, you mentioned that you're part of an information sharing team, basically. You're conferencing weekly with um, other pulmonary critical care docs around the state um, to, uh, to talk about what you're seeing and, and a, a, an approach, is that right? Yeah, not just around the state, yeah. um, even across the nation and even um, China and, and Italy. You know, the, the the amazing thing about this sort of technology is, you know, I can converse with people in China and Italy and at you know New York City and um, Washington uh, and discuss what they're seeing and how they're managing these patients and what to expect, um, which, you know, isn't something we had the ability to do during you know, pandemics in the past. And so I think for those of us who have not yet been hit hard, we've got the chance to learn how to take care of these patients. Yeah, and information moves so quickly and it, it is a unique situation because uh, things have happened so fast. Um, the media reports on a lot of scientific information, whether um, whether we feel it's adequately covered or not. And so I think that's that's really what something that we want to tackle tonight is is our thoughts on treatments. Um, I would love to ask you. You've been a many time guest here at the Prairie Doc. Um, I'm sitting. I'll never sit in this chair and not think about um, my Dr. Rick Holm, and I know he was a dear friend of yours. Um, tell us a tell us a story or a memory about. Rick before we get started. Sure, I think, you know, if you ever met Rick, you felt like um, you were his friend immediately. Um, and so uh, he had just that sort of infectious personality that everybody who interacted with him was happier for doing it. And I remember um, it was in here, I think in 2014, the South Dakota American College of Physicians meeting. And I think Rick was president at the time. And he had done a tribute to Dr. Thomas Brathwaite. Braithwaite. Um, Tom had passed away, I think just, you know, a few weeks before the, uh, before the uh, conference and um, Rick showed his musical talents and his great um, compassion and uh, just, you know, made us all feel um, less sad about Tom passing away. You know, Rick always found a way to, to, to keep everybody positive and, and I try to, to try to do that and emulate what he showed to me and to his patients and to all of us that he interacted with. He sang a song. I don't know if you were there um, at that time. It was 2014, I believe, and that he had written himself. And um, it was touching and yet also, um, you know, uh, lighthearted. Um, you know, he didn't didn't want to find 
um, sadness uh, in the passing of his good friend. He wanted to recognize all the great things that Dr. Braithwaite had accomplished. And so Rick was just that way. And with every situation, we could really use him in a pandemic. Yeah, I know, I um, think about him but, a lot right now. But he's instilled all these qualities in us. And so we just have to carry them forward as best as we can. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mike. Um, let's dive in to about treatments because I think a lot of the questions and a lot of the things on our viewers' minds has to do with treatments and probably most specifically hydroxychloroquine, um, which is a drug that there has been a lot of media reporting about. Um, hydroxychloroquine uh, it was developed as an anti-malarial in the U.S. and the developed world anymore. It's used most often in autoimmune diseases like lupus. Um, but there, there were some early studies um, that looked at some various markers about hydroxychloroquine in this disease. Tell, give us the update. What do we know about hydroxychloroquine? Um, what, what do we still not know? What hesitations should we have about possibly using this drug? Sure. And so we're going to speak about it from a scientific perspective, nothing political or, or media hype. It's just going to be the science behind hydroxychloroquine because science doesn't involve emotion. It doesn't involve politics. It's just the hard facts of science. And so hydroxychloroquine is a very effective medication for prevention of malaria. Um, and it also works really well in um, connective tissue diseases and some dermatologic diseases. Um, it does have toxicities and those don't go away. Um, it, it has been shown in a petri dish or in the lab to work to decrease the replication of coronaviruses, um, especially with study with the initial SARS coronavirus from back in 2001. Um, but it's never been proven in any way to improve outcomes within a patient's body. In other words, it works in a Petri dish or in, in the laboratory, but it's never been shown to actually work in a person. And the trials that have been done thus far have not been well designed, nor have the results been properly peer reviewed. And the data that we do have available suggests no benefit to hydroxychloroquine in patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. Now there are tons of studies going on, mm -hmm. really good studies, not only in patients that are hospitalized, but now studies in patients that are you know, exposed, has a prophylactic method. South Dakota's study is designed that way. And so we're gonna get, I think, some more valuable data. We all want something to work here, but we can't jump on stuff just because we want it to work. Um, and, you know, and then there's sometimes the argument, well, what can it hurt? Um, well, it can hurt. Um, and there is lots of reports of toxicities to hydroxychloroquine. And so we have to be wise, mm -hmm. wait for the science, check your emotions. We all want something, but um, we can't do harm to patients without without knowing the treatment works. Yeah, and this is a common phenomenon in medical studies, right? Treatments that work or appear to work in the Petri dish or to some degree in the lab or with what we would call an outcome that isn't meaningful. So for example, the French study of hydroxychloroquine that got a lot of media attention was the outcome they were testing was presence of the virus in the nose. Um, when, the, when the outcome we actually care about is how many people died, how many people went on a ventilator, and how sick did people get, and those more um, holistic outcomes in a patient's life that matter. And so um, those are the things that when, when I look at a medical study, that one of the first things that I read is what outcomes did they measure and do I care about it? And we just don't have studies that help us there yet. Right. And mm -hmm. it's really important. You know, some patients ask me, well, why do you have to have a control group or some group that's not taking the medicine? Why can't you just treat the ones you want and then compare them to ones who didn't get the drug? And that's because it's just inherent within our human nature. If we know someone's getting a medicine we want to work, we're going to interpret it, um, you know, different signs or symptoms to indicate that those patients on the medicine are doing better than those who are not. That's just bias that we cannot get away from. And so good studies are randomized, they're blinded, and they have a treatment group and a control group. Yeah, tell us what blinded means. Uh, that means that if you are you know, participating, has the uh, scientist, the physician prescribing or you know, doing the, the test on a patient, you don't know if they're getting the drug or if they're getting a placebo or if they're getting the test or they're getting the placebo test. You have no idea mm -hmm. um, because if you do know whether you want to admit it or not, 
um, you're going to be biased. Right. Right. So a good study aims to take out all those potential, what we call confounding factors, out of the equation. No study is perfect, but really a randomized control trial is, is the best design when we're talking about testing a drug. It is, and I get yeah. that we're urgent to find something yeah. that works here. I get that, but um, science still has to be done the way it's always done, or it's not valid. Yeah. What adverse outcomes have we seen reported with hydroxychloroquine? I mean, I think a lot of sentiment early was, well, it's a pretty safe drug, and, and so why not use it? But tell us about the safety profile of it. And so the biggest risks, and you know, when I'm interacting with these individuals who are giving it to a lot of patients in areas like New York City, is for cardiac arrhythmias. Um, in other words, heart beat abnormalities. And one that's very serious is called torsades de points, and that can lead to cardiac death. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also other side effects. When I visited with some of my colleagues up at Avera McKinnon, um, they had been using it, and they were seeing liver function test abnormalities as well as muscle injury. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's happening everywhere else too. And then it can cause more subtle side effects like stomach upset. Mm -hmm. um, it can cause eye problems when used mm -hmm. in a prolonged basis, but but there are serious significant complications from taking hydroxychloroquine. And you know, if it works, if we find a study that proves it to work, I think then those risks are outweighed by the benefit. But at mm -hmm. this point, there's no definite benefit mm -hmm. um, and there are some risks. And so whenever we're doing anything in life, especially in medicine, it's a risk versus benefit analysis. And at this point, um, the risks outweigh the benefits. Yeah, good. And so bottom line, hydroxychloroquine, verdict is still out, we think. Though, I mean, like all things in medicine, you may find differing opinions on this and, and intelligent people interpret things differently, but we really don't, we just don't have the good evidence. We don't, and I'm excited that they're looking for, yeah. for good evidence. I want, I want that to come out. Um, and as we know, any good study, you're not looking for a positive or a negative result. You're just looking for useful information. And even though a study may come out negative, that's still useful. Yeah. And so we can't forget to always make our studies, design them well. That's the key. The outcome yeah. is key. It's the study quality. Yeah. Good. And I'm sure we'll be getting questions about uh, the study that's going to be taking place in South Dakota. I will note that the next hour on South Dakota Public Broadcasting will have a, a complete show about that study. And so, and I don't have unique information on that, but really what's being studied will be um, exposed patients, patients that don't have the disease and up as a prophylactic treatment with hydroxychloroquine, but more to come in the next hour on that. Right, and I, I don't go into the details, so I mm -hmm. think people would be better focusing on that next program for that information. Yeah. Good. Um, the holy grail of our efforts is an effective vaccine. The development of a vaccine goes through many phases and usually takes 10 to 15 years. A vaccine for COVID-19 has been fast-tracked, but may still take at least 12 to 18 months because this virus presents a unique set of challenges. It's, it's understanding how the host immune uh, system hey, responds Joni. to the virus and, I don't have uh, and defining that protective immunity. We're just now learning about how people who have been infected might uh, be protected from reinfection. Um, we've heard a bit about the convalescent plasma that's being used in some patients. This is uh, transfers antibodies from someone who's recovered from the infection into someone who's actively infected as a way to help the infected person clear that infection. Uh, that's been showing some promise. So there's some evidence that antibodies might be playing a role in helping to clear the infection, which would then make that a, a likely target of vaccine-induced immunity. Um, but we still need to understand what antibodies, what sort of level of antibodies we want, um, and, and how the virus will respond to interaction with those antibodies that will uh, define um, uh, you know, the, the development of a vaccine. My lab at the University of South Dakota studies uh, viruses and uh, vaccine development in particular. We study influenza viruses um, in the context of vaccine-induced immunities and secondary bacterial infections. Um, and with this uh, new uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, we are getting involved in, in learning a little more about the immune response against SARS-CoV-2, trying to help in the development of vaccines against 
um, uh, against this new virus, uh, using our knowledge of how uh, the immune system interacts with influenza to then try and develop vaccines that would be useful against SARS-CoV-2. This virus is an RNA virus, uh, similar, uh, you know, influenza is also an RNA virus. Um, this is, uh, RNA viruses have a much higher mutation rate than say a DNA virus. Um, and we already know that it does mutate. Um, and you can tell that by looking at the genetic code. Um, now the important mutations for viruses are going to be the ones that change the ability to transmit from person to person or between species. Uh, the sort of severity of the illness that it causes, and then the ability to escape the host immune system. And those are the questions that we don't know about this virus. Um, and we'll have to learn as we, again, get, gain more experience with this antibody-mediated immunity, how the host is protected, and then the development of vaccines. Um, and so those are gonna be the, the sort of mutations we're gonna to have to keep an eye out for. With influenza, as I mentioned, the vaccines were uh, developed and released in 1945. We didn't really know influenza changed in the way that it does until 1947 when the vaccine, while it induced a strong immune response, didn't protect against the virus that was circulating. And that's when they realized this virus changes. And then they established a surveillance network in 1952 uh, to then start tracking those changes and, and coming up with the system that we have today where we change the vaccine based on those changes. your program and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion about the COVID-19 virus. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Uh, now Dr. Pietela and I just got through a, a sort of in-depth conversation about hydroxychloroquine and we've, ha we've had some questions come in about this that maybe we'll just rapid fire through some of these hydroxychloroquine questions before we move on. A caller from Yankton asks if people taking hydroxychloroquine are protected from getting COVID-19. So, um, you know, the registries that are out there um, gathering information about patients who um, have had the virus don't show any advantage to patients taking HCQ, hydroxychloroquine, with respect to their risk to get the virus. But the doses that they take are generally less than what's expected to have an effect if it's going to have any at all. So the short answer is no. Not that we know. Yeah. yeah. An email from a woman in rural Swiftbird, South Dakota asks, hydroxychloroquine is contraindicated in patients with heart problems, potentially causing sudden cardiac death, which we just talked about. Was there discussion or protocol put in place for South Dakota's Native American population, which has a higher rate of heart disease? Um, so, and it's an interesting question. I mean, any, any well-designed study and really any study is gonna have what we call exclusion criteria. And presumably for most studies studying hydroxychloroquine, it would exclude people with certain cardiac conditions. Um, yeah, but if those time. are undiagnosed, we, we may not, that may not happen, right? Yeah, anytime you're enrolling people in a study, mm -hmm. you have a criteria that you must follow strictly that will exclude those patients who you think will be at increased risk for harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I can't speak to how the, the South Dakota study is designed um, specifically there, but um, possibly excluding people with cardiac disease. A caller asks if, if using hydroxychloroquine on South Dakotans is safe since there could be some harm. Are they using other medications instead? And we'll, we'll get to maybe other potential medications, but I think we did touch on the potential harms that we have concerns about. Right, and I think they feel the harm. The risk is low enough if we monitor carefully mm -hmm. uh, and patients understand their risk and enroll freely um, that, that um, it's acceptable. And so we'll just have to watch closely. Some studies we do have to stop early because there are side effects from right. medicines. And in any study, a, pa a patient before they are enrolled go through informed consent. So a patient would be informed of potential risk and, and the design of the study before they accepted that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's touch on a couple other um, treatments that are getting some uh, press and, and have some interest. Let's talk about remdesivir. Can you tell us what is remdesivir and, and what do we have on that? So remdesivir was a drug that was used in the uh, Ebola outbreaks uh, over in um, Africa. And it works, um, has the virus enters the cell and then 
uses the cell structures to develop or to produce, sorry, more uh, virus bodies, um, that remdesivir can work through the replication process to inhibit it. Um, and then the virus can't continue to uh, replicate. But uh, the studies that are now, the preliminary information from the studies available with this novel coronavirus aren't showing any benefit to the remdesivir. And so they're enrolling more and more people. Um, but right now, it doesn't look like the preliminary data is very promising. Yeah, but certainly a lot of studies being done on this drug as well. Yeah, again, um, based on the yeah. data from the Ebola stuff. And then another one that's got on a lot of press is the use of what we call convalescent plasma. So tell us what that term means um, and, and what we know about plasma. So convalescent means that you had an infection. In this case, it would be the COVID-19 coronavirus infection mm -hmm. and you've survived it and you've recovered. And that's usually because your body produces antibodies against the virus. And so we can take patients who have been proven to have it on the antigen test, the nasal swab. So they have that and then it's proven that they had it. We can test their serum. And if indeed they have the antibodies in their blood, then we can take blood from them, um, derive the plasma and then the serum from them that contains those antibodies and use it in patients who are very sick acutely with the virus, those in the ICU and on life support mm -hmm. to try and introduce those antibodies against the virus into that person to stop the virus from continuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of study going on about this, a little more in depth because we have to have proper donors, right? And, and you have to be so far out from your infection before you could donate serum. Yeah, it takes a certain amount of time for your body to produce the antibodies. In this disease, it looks like it's somewhere in the five to 14 day range. And then we also have to be aware that patients who've recovered can still shed virus and be infectious, um, you know, up to maybe 20, 25 days after they've had it. So uh, it's in development. Um, you know, what I will say is convalescent plasma for things like influenza, um, and other viral infections hasn't been particularly successful. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the optimism is tempered by that. Right, and so a treatment that it's not a new type of treatment. This has been studied in other diseases before, infectious diseases. Yeah. yeah, good. We're getting some questions on some other treatments. A viewer on Facebook asks, I have heard a medicine for treating altitude sickness might work, and we actually got another question specifically about acetazolamide or diamox, which I assume is what the, the, the initial question is about. What have we heard about this? That's not yeah, right. so mm -hmm. there's been some speculation, especially early in this pandemic, that the appearance of the lungs was like something called HAPE, H-A-P-E, high altitude pulmonary edema, because the lungs looked very, or they are very wet. Um, and so there was some discussion about would acetazolamide be beneficial. The reality is these patients have ARDS and they have varying phenotypes, different variations or severities of the ARDS, a, acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's like a type of pneumonia with associated inflammation. Diuretics do help to keep the lungs dry and acetazolamide is a diuretic but it's not as potent as something like Lasix or Furosemide. So I would lay aside the acetazolamide idea. Okay. Um, another question of viewer on Facebook asks, can we touch more on blood clotting aspects of COVID and how this can be prevented? And on a similar note, I have seen some reports on trials for use of what we call lytic agents or sort of clot busting agents and blood thinners in this. So t tell us what, what reports we're having about that. So again, um, critical illness of any type, um, whether it's from COVID-19 or, or any infection or trauma or post-surgery has increased risk for blood clots. Although it seems based on some of the data out there, there's a certain subset of these COVID-19 patients that are highly prone to developing blood clots like in their legs or in their lungs. We always put patients in the ICU and in the hospital on a dose of a blood thinner. Anyone who's been in the hospital knows that shot of Lovenox that they get. And that's critical, especially in, in critically ill patients. Now there's some discussion that there's a subset that might benefit from more blood thinning than just what is typical. And we don't have enough data to know exactly who those patients are yet. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and certainly there's a lot of our viewers out there who are all, always on a blood thinner, be it warfarin or um, some of these other blood thinners for heart or, or, or blood clotting issues. And we really don't have any data to know if, if that has any effect on this illness at all. Um, a viewer on Facebook asks, what about Actemra for treatment? I don't remember for sure what Actemra is. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's one of the IL-6 inhibitors. So I can't, I've seen it mentioned out there, but I don't know enough about Actemra. Yeah, I don't have any special knowledge on that one at all either. Um, a caller from Madison asked, how come we don't use penicillin much anymore? Could that be used? Yeah, so penicillin works only on bacteria that have a cell wall and viruses, not a bacteria doesn't have a cell wall. So antibiotics don't work on any viruses. Mm -hmm. um, it just it isn't how they work. And so antibiotics should never be given for viral infections, um, including COVID-19. Now, some patients may get a secondary bacterial infection um, after, during the time they have coronavirus. And so then it may be indicated, but for a virus alone, antibiotics don't work. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I got some cl some help and clarification that Actemra is tocilizumab, which I believe is the monoclonal body I IL-6 inhibitor, yeah, and that is being studied. So tell us what, you, what, what we know about that. Yeah, so I was on a conference call uh, with some uh, experts from Stanford where they're doing a trial of tocilizumab, where actually it's not a trial, they're measuring IL-6 levels, and actually it appears that IL-6 levels are less in this COVID-19 infection than they are in typical ARDS, so. And Mike, I'm gonna I, jump in IL-6. Let's clarify what that is for our viewers oh, too as we go sure. on. IL-6 is an interleukin. Mm -hmm. uh, interleukins are something our body releases in response to infection, or inflammation. It's a protein that our cells, our white blood cells produce in an attempt to you know, stave off whatever's causing the infection or the, uh, the insult to our body. And so the thought is if we can inhibit these IL-6, we can prevent what some are referring to as a cytokine storm. Um, but the preliminary data, again, is, is not promising. Okay. Um, some other questions coming in. A caller from Sioux Falls asks, what can be done to decrease amount of the virus on a more environmental basis? They mentioned ozone or UV light. Do we know what kills this virus and what might help us from a decontamination perspective? Yeah, so the most important thing is hand washing. Um, it, you know, soap and all of the uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizers kill it instantly. Um, and so same with on surfaces around your house or at the workplace, good disinfectants take this virus out. And so it's important to practice really, really good hand hygiene. And the same with your surroundings, keep everything as clean as possible. Um, and UV light and ozone, does seem to be very effective at eliminating the virus as well. And in fact, they're using UV light um, to decontaminate personal protective equipment mm -hmm. because we have a shortage of masks and gowns and things. Um, and so let the scientists continue to look at what's best from that perspective. But sure, uh, those things, it's not a particularly tough virus. Mm -hmm. If you do a good job of protecting your personal space and keeping your hands clean and the stuff around you clean, mm -hmm. you can protect yourself. Yeah. Um, a caller from Sioux Falls asked, can the virus travel in the air and could it travel farther on a windy day? Well, that's a great question. So um, the primary way that influenza coronaviruses, the common cold is transmitted is through droplets. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, little pieces of spit that come out of our nose or our mouth and land on our hands or land on an object and then someone touches that or, or the droplet gets on our hand and then we touch our face and then it gets into our, our airway or our eyes. Some viruses are also aerosolized um, and it varies from virus to virus. And the reason aerosolization is more concerning is the virus can hang around in the air around us and that's harder to disinfect and it can stick around longer. And so, so in theory, on a windy day or if someone is coughing forcefully, um, that could propel the virus further. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a caller from Platt asked, what surface can this virus stay on and for how long? And I know we've all seen sort of the graphics from the CDC about estimating that, but 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can't speak specifically to it. It can survive on different surfaces for longer periods of time. You know, copper, for instance, has some antibacterial, antiviral characteristics just uh, in and of the way the metal is, is, is. Um, but there are some data to suggest it can survive on surfaces for, you know, greater than a few days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, an emailer asked, I have heard that some research is being done with tuberculosis antibodies. Is there any truth to this? I've not heard of this. I don't think I've seen anything um, in the mainstream science uh, data and, and uh, stuff that I review that's talking about tuberculosis antibodies. Okay. Okay. Um, a couple more hydroxychloroquine follow-up questions. A caller from Frederick asked, if a person is very sick from the virus, why not use hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, and that's something I tried to touch on a little bit before is, you know, what's the harm? Mm -hmm. um, we might as well just give it a try and see if they can get better because they're getting so much sicker anyways. And what I would say is that we do know how to treat even the sickest patients with ARDS from things like COVID-19 or coronavirus. And the treatments that we can offer, they work. And as long as we're not overwhelmed by patients because we're not social distancing, like we're doing a good job now in Yankton mm -hmm. and in most communities, we can take care of you. Mm -hmm. um, even if you're extremely sick with the treatments that we know work mm -hmm. and they work, um, hydroxychloroquine doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so to give it to someone just because it can't hurt um, is just as wrong as giving it to someone when it doesn't work. Yeah, good. Um, a caller from Aberdeen asked, how long would hydroxychloroquine be prescribed to treat this virus in the setting of a trial? Or if it and again, prescribed. that's going to vary on the trial design, yeah. and they'll get more information about that from the South Dakota trial in the hour to follow. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, the studies I've seen have varied from five days to 14 days, but it mm -hmm. certainly wouldn't be expected, I don't think, to be a long-term treatment. Yeah, good. Okay. We've all heard the drumbeat about social distancing, washing your hands, and the use of PPE, or personal protective equipment. But this may be new to some of us. The most important thing for people to remember is to always perform hand hygiene first. So whether that's actually at the sink washing your hands or using alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So what they're gonna to want to do when they have a mask and remember, wearing a mask is really important out in public because it reduces not only the droplets that are coming out of your mouth in case you are potentially ill, but it also stops droplets from coming to your face. And right now, the statistic is about 80% of the droplets can be stopped. What's really important for people to know is that when they're out in the public, they can't mess around with the mask once it's on your face. You really want to get it on there and then leave it alone until it's time to take it off because that's when you're going to contaminate yourself is when you're trying to adjust it so the best thing to do is just make sure it fits comfortably around your ears especially if you think your shopping trip maybe is where you're going to wear it and your shopping trip is going to last an hour you want it to be comfortable that whole time because again you don't want to be adjusting it so with clean hands you're gonna get it around your ears as comfortable as you need, but really you wanna make sure you pull it down under your chin and then make sure you fit it up over your nose. Even the worst mask is better than no mask. So a cloth mask um, always works in a pinch and it's gonna give you the least amount of safety out of all the masks that you could purchase or that you could make, right? And you don't have to be able to even sew. You can make it from an old t-shirt or a bandana or a scarf or any sort of fabric. And if you wear a cloth mask, it's better to have it in more than one layer. Uh, just the extra layers will provide protection. Then there's what we call a standard mask or a surgical mask. They're really the same kind of thing, but they're more of a paper material and they have a filtration system in them. It's really important to at least wear the mask. The gloves, I kind of caution, just because if you're not used to wearing them, a lot of people kind of use these as a safety net. They end up touching a lot of surfaces, and before they know it, they've touched their face and they've contaminated themselves. Or even more so right now with the way life is with our phones, we're kind of attached to our telephones. We end up touching our telephones with our dirty gloved hands and contaminating ourselves that way. 
taking off the glove is a little bit more tricky, especially if you're not well versed in healthcare. So really what you want to do is you want to pinch one side. I happen to be right handed, so I always use my right hand first. You pinch the glove. I don't know if I'm at a good angle, maybe that's better. You pinch the glove and then you roll it away from you so that the outside now becomes the inside. And do it again the same way with the other glove. Thanks for that, Bunny. We in, in the studio here, everyone's in masks. I've got my nice mask that my friend Mandy Greenway, who's been a guest on the show, sent to me. Um, so these are things that we're all thinking about as we go out in the community and those kind of things. Um, Dr. Pietel, I do want to make sure that we touch on testing um, and the status of testing. Um, generally speaking, when we're talking about diagnosis of this disease, we're talking about what we call an antibody test, which is the nasal swab, or excuse me, an, an antigen test or an RNA test, which is a swab of the nose. But we're also hearing more about antibody testing and how that might be used in the future as, as we talk from a bigger standpoint about who is protected and who has been exposed. So can you give us an update on testing? Certainly, I think as we all struggle with the economic impacts of being shut down and we're looking for ways to restart things and you know in the medical area and we want to be able to do the things that we need to do for patients like surgeries and screening tests and just routine visits and so the way to do that most safely is to test more people to determine who's at risk and who's not at risk um, and as you mentioned the nasal swab which tries to get pieces of the rna from the virus and then replicate them to tell us if someone has the active infection is out there and it's being used, but in a limited fashion because we don't have enough of those tests. And so now we have developed an antibody test where it measures your IgG. That's again, another protein your body makes in response to the virus that indicates that you were exposed um, and that you may be immune. It doesn't mean for sure you're immune because immunity is more complex than just having the antibody. But if we can get that test out and test a bunch of people and determine who's safe because they're probably immune or have been exposed versus those who are not, we can make um, wise decisions about how to open up society more. Mm -hmm. Good. And I think the, the challenge here is that these tests are all new and we're gaining information about the how statistically good these tests are. Um, certainly what we wouldn't want was to would be to adopt a test with a lot of what we call false positives and had false reassurances about immunity. Yeah, right? and, and this test looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. I've looked at it carefully. Um, and the one we're going to use is from the Mayo Clinic. And it's quite sensitive and specific. The number of false positives and false negatives are quite low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing we have to keep in mind, as Victor said earlier, the virologist, mm -hmm. just because you have the antibodies um, doesn't mean that you're immune or that you, you know, definitely don't have to worry about getting infected again. We just don't know enough enough about that. Right. Right, good. So, but another topic very worthy of further study. Um, we'll get back to some of these viewer questions. An emailer asks, my 11 year old has severe asthma. He currently has a mark on his back that looks suspicious for Lyme disease and his pediatrician would like to see him. Do I dare bring him to the clinic in Sioux Falls or should I just watch it for a few more days? And I think this is a real, I mean, all of us in healthcare, we know the urgency of, we kind of shut down business as usual in our clinics and that was necessary, but I think we all have this underlying concern that we don't want people to be afraid to come in when they ought to be evaluated. And we, we also don't want to let the ball drop on, on chronic disease management and all those things. So yeah, and, and what I would say is I'm using a lot of telehealth, just mm -hmm. like we're doing tonight to see patients. Um, you know, I can't listen to their lungs like I'd like uh, and really put my hands on them like I'd like, but a lot of cases I can manage over the camera. And this sounds like one that could potentially be managed over the camera if mm -hmm. the doctor's office has that ability. If you do need to come in, we are seeing patients and we are keeping anybody who might even remotely have coronavirus out of the clinic yeah. um, and hospital unless they've been tested. 
Um, if someone comes in and we find out they have symptoms that could indicate that, we put them in a different part of the clinic and all places are doing that. So if you call ahead and explain your concern, yep. um, you can get seen one way or another for sure. So so please don't hesitate to do that. Yeah, and so I would probably follow the, the pediatrician's advice if, if and like you said, we're doing things as safely as we can. Uh, the, your child will probably be given a mask if you don't already have them upon entering the clinic. So. Um, a caller from Edmonds near Ipswich asks, why are places asking for blood dro donation? Is that a treatment, not plasma donation? So probably talking about some of the calls from, from the Red Cross and, and other organizations for blood donations. Yeah, we always have a shortage of blood. Yeah. We, we can always use more blood. And when somebody's shut in and, and afraid to go out, then we're gonna really meet a crisis if we don't have blood donors. And so mm -hmm. um, we've been really promoting it. And so uh, they are doing everything to make sure it's as safe as possible for you. But, but if we don't have our useful blood donors, um, we're going to run low on blood, not because of COVID-19 right. disease, but because of the fact people aren't going in. Yeah. So calls for blood donations for the same reason we're always calling for blood donations, but more urgent just because less donors are out there, right? Um, an emailer asked, I heard vitamin C and zinc can destroy the virus. Is anyone looking into that? What about colloidal silver? Yeah, so there's always this discussion about vitamin C and zinc with any viral infection, right? It's promoted by especially people who sell vitamin C and zinc. And there are some characteristics of vitamin C and the metal zinc that do appear to inhibit the virus, especially again in the Petri dish or in an experimental fashion. But there haven't been any good trials to show that certain doses of vitamin C or certain doses of zinc, that they actually have any impact. And so, you know, it's probably not harmful to take them, mm -hmm. although they can have side effects, especially if taken in excessive amounts, but there's no proof um, that that works. Colloidal silver, similar. It's been shown in the lab to inhibit how the virus can replicate. But again, once the virus is in our body, that's a totally different situation. Right. A caller from Hendricks, Minnesota says he heard you should not mow your lawn. Is that true? Could it put you at risk? I haven't heard that one. That I have not heard. I think you can, you know, unless you're mowing your lawn beside your neighbor within six feet um, or sharing lawnmowers that you're transmitting virus yeah. from, it's perfectly fine to mow your lawn. Yeah. Okay. A caller from Sioux Center, Iowa asks, what are the early symptoms of COVID-19? And a similar call from Hendricks, Minnesota asked about chills being a symptom. So that's a great question. You know, coronavirus, this COVID-19 disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus usually causes nothing worse than the common cold. And the vast majority of us will just feel like we do if we have a common cold or the flu. Fever seems to be the most telltale symptom. Um, some studies would indicate 98% of patients truly infected have a fever. Chills come with a fever, and so you shouldn't be chilled unless you're having a fever. And then it's just sort of the typical symptoms of cough and sore throat. And, you know, if you're short of breath, that's the most concerning symptom. Mm -hmm. And that's what tells us something bad could be happening. Good. A 65-year-old caller from Webster asked, can leaving my mask on the dash of my pickup kill the virus? <laughs> so he's using the sunlight um, mm -hmm. theory, and it, it, it can. You know, mm -hmm. the, the sunlight can have an effect on decreasing the virus's viability. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's okay to do that. But the most important thing is the instructions that were given earlier, and you can find videos on the internet about mm -hmm. how to properly put a mask on, we call that donning a mask, and how to take a mask off, we call that doffing a mask. Mm -hmm. And it's critical not to touch the front of that mask. And every time you touch the mask to do proper hand hygiene, mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. Yeah, and some things are dependent on the material of the mask too. I understand that, that light could degrade certain materials and make them a little bit less effective in filtering too. Yeah. Um, but I applaud you for, for having that mask with you. A caller from Huron asks, could an antihistamine be used to help? Yeah, I think um, it would help symptoms that might be related to allergies, which are very common this mm -hmm. time of year, but it won't work against the virus in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and that gets to a point that it's it's challenging in the primary care clinic to take some of these triage calls because allergies are common right now and to to try and sort out what's what when we're worried about COVID-19 um, is challenging so we're, we are encouraging everyone to call ahead and most clinics I think have a good triage process to get people evaluated the right way. And I think that's where fever and chills help. You don't get fever and chills right. with, with allergies. A caller from Aberdeen asks, since we are sneezing and coughing into our elbow, how long could the virus stay there? Again, a good question. Mm -hmm. It can stay on in surfaces or clothing. And so um, the idea, you know, that maybe we can bump elbows, um, you know, or greet each other in other physical ways um, should be uh, done away with for now. Um, you know, nod your head or wave, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it could certainly exist in your, uh, you know, in your elbow area or anywhere and it could be there for hours. Good. A caller from Rapid City says they heard sometimes people come to the hospital too late, too sick to get much help. Have we heard of places sending patients home with a pulse oximeter to help monitor for symptoms so it doesn't become too late? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, we're doing that now. Um, you know, what, as I was mentioning just a bit ago, those symptoms that are common, fever, sore throat, cough, those are usually okay, but the shortness of breath is an indication of bad stuff happening. And if that shortness of breath is not associated with low oxygen, patients seem to be okay, but it's that patient whose oxygen level, which we can detect with the little device we put on our finger, when that starts to drop, that signals trouble. And the treatment is oxygen therapy. And so those patients are the ones that either need to be hospitalized or potentially treated at the nursing home or in their home with oxygen. And so now Avera has a program um, where patients who are suspected to have it or known to have it can get an oximeter um, for free, um, and then they get a daily visit with a nurse via telemedicine to do report their symptoms. Because we know based on stuff happening elsewhere, when that oxygen level starts to drop, that's when things get really serious. Yeah, great. Um, we, we have short time left, so I wanna hit this last question uh, of you were on Facebook asked, why is a vaccine taking so long? So let's talk about yeah. vaccine. Mm -hmm. So um, as you know, there's uh, lots of discussion about vaccines. Are they safe? Are they not safe? And so the most critical thing, again, with any medicine, with any vaccine, with any treatment is being certain it's safe. You know, effectiveness is important too, but number one, it, it can't cause harm. And so most vaccines take years to be developed and approved because they're busy studying for harmful effects and it takes lots of patients to receive a treatment to determine if it's causing harm in most instances because harm isn't obvious. And so to think we could get a coronavirus vaccine and get one approved that's effective and won't hurt anyone within anything less than 12 to 18 months is, is just not the proper way to think about it. If we can get it by 18 months, I think that would be a, almost unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And again, vaccines are hard to make against coronaviruses. Yeah, and I, you know, I think I, I read somewhere that the record for getting a vaccine from research and development to being used was about four years up to now. So mm -hmm. what we're hoping for is unprecedented. And then the other yes. challenge is once, once we do find that vaccine and it's approved, producing the vaccine isn't a small task either. So getting it to the masses, even once we have an effective vaccine, will take some time as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, a caller from Brookings asked, can you get the virus off of plant material? Hmm. You know, I don't know that I've seen any studies that say that you can't, mm -hmm. um, but we're told that our food, um, you know, from these processing plants and things that we don't have to be concerned that it's contaminated. Um, I think you'd be more at risk to get it from the, you know, if there was a plant product in a bag of, you know, groceries or something, getting it from the transport material as opposed to the product itself. Good, good. Um, and if if we can just comment again on the information sharing, comment on the unique situation on social media and all the various ways that we're sharing information that we've never done before. Yeah, so it's an amazing opportunity to use social media in a way that's much more productive, I think, than it's <laughs> often used um, to allow scientists to communicate across the world on something as simple as Twitter um, or Facebook and to say, hey, I've got this study. Please enroll your patients or get your data into it um, so we can all review what's happening on here. in real time. 
and determine how we can recognize who's at risk for bad outcomes, what treatments are effective, what we should be doing in the ICU, what we should be doing on an outpatient basis. Every day you can share that knowledge um, easily. Yeah, great. We'll be right back. We feel privileged to have had the honor of creating a legacy of service through the Prairie Doc organization. It has been our desire and goal to share health information that is not influenced by marketing or sales, but rather is based on science. We started in the 80s with a newspaper article and expanded in the 90s with a radio show. In 2003, we started a TV program, and in 2010, we added our social media platforms. This has been a team effort made possible by many volunteer physicians and experts serving as hosts and guests. All of them are Prairie Docs. Thanks to them, we've been given the ability to pass the torch so that this legacy may continue beyond my time on this earth. Please join me in embracing our team of Prairie Doc physicians, each committed to this mission. Family physician Andrew Ellsworth, Deb Johnston, and Jill Cruz, along with internist Kelly Evans, all from Brookings, South Dakota. These volunteer physicians, and many others, have in the past and will in the future serve as authors of Prairie Doc newspaper columns, host of our TV and radio programs. Thank, Thank you. you. It is the year 2020, and we find ourselves in the midst of a rapidly changing worldwide pandemic of a novel coronavirus. This virus and public knowledge of it has spread and changed with greater speed than our scientific method can accommodate. Science and the progression of medical knowledge is by nature and necessity slow and methodical. This pandemic is neither. But we ought not abandon our deliberate striving for truth, not now, not because it feels too slow. The gold standard in medical science, the randomized controlled trial, or RCT, is a relatively new development in the history of medicine. The British epidemiologist Sir Bradford Hill is credited with designing and publishing the first RCT in medical science, a study of streptomycin in treating tuberculosis in 1948. Sure, even randomized controlled trials are never perfect and they require large numbers of patients, time and investment. However, their design does seek to remove variables that are sure to taint all other trial designs. They are the best we have especially when it comes to evaluating a therapeutic intervention. Much speculation has arisen, both in the medical community and the media, about possible drug therapies for this disease. Hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, remdesivir, convalescent plasma, and others. Why have so many physicians and scientists been less than fully enthusiastic about these interventions? It's because we do not have sufficient data yet. There hasn't been time for any quality randomized controlled trials. Still, if these things might help, why not just throw them at patients with severe cases of COVID-19? What do we have to lose? The truth is the history of medicine is flush with examples of therapies that we thought would be helpful. Studies in the lab were favorable, we had promising initial observational data, and expert opinion was in favor of it. But when put to the test, they were not. In many of these cases, the interventions turned out not only to be not helpful, but harmful when they were tested in a randomized controlled trial. We must demand a high threshold of proof before accepting therapy as effective. History has taught us that mistakes are made if we do not. We want solid evidence that an intervention helps more than it hurts before recommending we give it to everyone with this disease. Yes, even if it seems slow. One thing is for certain, our collective scientific energy will be best spent investing in developing a vaccine for this highly contagious virus. Fortunately, there are very smart people all over the world working around the clock in this endeavor. A vaccine, now that would be a game changer. In the meantime, 
Our best defense against this pandemic continues to be social distancing. So stay home and minimize contact with others. The more we flatten the curve now, the more people will benefit from the hard work of science in the future. A big thank you to our guest, my friend, Dr. Michael Pietela of Yankton for joining us tonight via Skype. His unique experience and knowledge brought much to our discussion tonight. If you would like more information about this program or to see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Next up tonight on SDPB is South Dakota Focus. They will be discussing COVID research and clinical trials in South Dakota, so please stay tuned. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. While COVID-19 is in the news, there are still other medical concerns we cannot forget. Call in your questions about diabetes, heart disease, or even coronavirus. It's Ask Anything, next time On Call with the Prairie Doc. Useful, scientific-based medical information delivered in a respectful and compassionate manner. This is what we get from the Prairie Docs. I am proud to serve on the board of the Healing Words Foundation. Our nonprofit organization works behind the scenes building financial support to continue and expand Prairie Doc programs. We thank the many health providers who volunteer their time to answer our health questions. Significant funding is required to produce and distribute video, radio, and print throughout the region. Your donations will help the Foundation continue to offer free and easy access to the entire library of Prairie Doc health education programs. I grew up with Rick Holm on the Prairies in DeSmit. On behalf of the Healing Words Foundation, and on behalf of a lifelong friend, we invite you to join our mission. Go to prairiedoc.org and click the donate button today. Thank, Thank you. you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Black Hills Medical Society. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society. Sioux Falls District Medical Society. Yankton District Medical Society. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. And Swiftel Communications. 